1 Samuel chapter 17, verse 28. Can you say amen if you're there? And Eliab, his eldest brother, heard when he spake unto the men, and Eliab's anger was kindled against David. And he said, Why camest thou hither? And whom hast thou left those few sheep in the wilderness? I know thy pride and thy naughtiness of thine heart. This is an elder brother speaking to a younger brother. They're brothers, they're relations. Are you hearing me? For thou art come down that thou mightest see the battle. And David said, what have I done? Is there not a cause? He turned from him toward another. He turned away from his brother to somebody else and spake after the same manner. And the people answered again after the former manner. And when the words were heard which David spake, they rehearsed him before Saul, and he sent for him. And David said to Saul, Let no man's heart fail because of him. Thy servant will go and fight with this Philistine. Let's place our Bibles down. I want to go before the Lord and I want to speak on this subject. Revival or rival? The power of unity. Jesus, we need you. We face so much as an individual, as families, as a church. We, we desire not only personal revival, but revivals in our families and definitely revival in our church. I pray for your divine help and intervention, Lord, as I bring forth this short Bible study tonight on behalf of unity and the power that it brings for every individual, for every family, for most definitely Souls Harbor Church. And everybody said in Jesus' name. God bless you. You can be seated. Unity is one of the most powerful things on the planet. Its greatest enemy is disunity. Against itself is brought to desolation. And every city or house divided against itself shall not stand. Very true saying. Just because you've gathered as a family doesn't mean there's unity. Just because you live together doesn't mean there's unity. Ecclesiastes tells us in chapter 4, verses 9, two are better than one because they have a good reward for their labor. For if they fall, the one will lift up his fellow. But woe to him that is alone when he falleth, for he hath not another to help him up. Revival or rival? United we stand. Divided we fall. Today, Tennis shoes have become big business. In fact, removing the confusion of COVID, I went back to 2018 and found that the global footwear market size was estimated at 207.6 billion with a B. One of the most popular tennis shoe is Nike. In fact, there's a division of their shoes called the Nike Flight Club. They actually have a website. One of the most expensive pairs are the Nike Zoom LeBron 6 New York City versions. Those shoes are the estimated cost of $83,787. You probably don't want to run down and get a pair of those, Brother Lawrence, just yet. 
why do I want to talk about Benny Juice? Well, listen, in 1964, Blue Ribbon Sports was founded by a man by the name of Bill Bowerman. He actually was a track coach, an athletic director in Oregon. He opened his first outlet store in 1966 and changed the name from Blue Ribbon to Nike. And he actually officially had his first outlet in 1972 and officially changed the name in 1978. They are now known in 170 countries, and Nike is a global leader in sports apparel with a value at at least $307 billion. Second to that, and I'm actually wearing a pair of their tennis shoes tonight, is Adidas, valued at $30 billion. But Nike was not always at the top. They were not at the top of, always of the sports apparel industry. Years ago, and I'm going to struggle with the name of the town as I get into it, and I may just call it H, I don't know. There were two brothers. They were interested in the sneaker industry even before there was one. The brothers, Adolf and Rudolf Dassler. Rudolf Dassler was born on March 26, 1898, in a small German town of Herzgenarach or something like that. It's probably whatever. Two years later, his younger brother Adolf was born on November 3rd, 1900. Rudolph, being the older brother, was more extroverted and outgoing, while Adolf was more quiet, thoughtful, and inventive. In 1913, Adolf was apprenticed by a baker and learned the useful skills needed to make a living, but he just knew that that trade wasn't for him. He finished his apprenticeship and decided to take after his father and learn the skills of a cobbler or shoemaker. As older brother Rudolph was shipped off to war in 1914, and Addy, as Adolf became named to know, began his endeavor to create his own shoe company. His passion for sports and all those type of things, he pondered the idea of creating some shoes that would enhance an athlete's performance. He began making shoes out of leftover uh, materials from the war in his mother's laundry. Rudolph, his brother, would return from war and pursue a career as a policeman, but he eventually decided that wasn't for him. And so they joined together, two, these two brothers, in 1923 and created, in 1923, a shoe manufacturing business. <sighs> Gebruder Dassler Sportsche Fabrik. I don't know if I got close, but I tried. So we know they started out together Mama's laundry room. Their big break crank, their, their big break came in 1936 during the Summer Olympics. Adolf approached American sprinter Jesse Owens about wearing a pair of their shoes during the competition. Jesse Owens agreed to wear the shoes after seeing the suitcase of the development that they have taken this athletic footwear. And we all know, those of you that know history, that Jesse Owens not only went on to be great, but won four gold medals. The Dassler Shoe Company became an overnight success. Sales exploded, was selling over 2,000 pairs of shoes. and Yearly sales grew until the outbreak of World War II where their business was taken over to support the war effort at that time. During and after the war, those intermediate years of World War II, problems started happening between the two brothers. The exact cause is still up for debate, but the theories are that simple jealousy, personal conflicts, political differences had led to a falling out. By 1948, the two broke apart and went their separate ways. In 1948, Rudolph established Ruda Tennis Shoes, short for Rudolph Dassler. But later, because of the awkwardness of the word, he changed and renamed his company to Puma after the animal. In 1949, Adolph established, his nickname being Addy, the Adidas Shoe Company. You would think that that would just be the end of it, but it, things were so bad that the brothers 
part in the split was so bad with sibling rivalry that one went to the north side of the river in the same city and the other went to the south. Things were so bad, even to the point that families and friends migrate, migrated to their perspective sides of the city as they joined a side. This seemingly small feud in the corner of a small town in Germany would end up having enormous repercussions on what future athletes would wear. The city was impacted by a feud of two brothers. As they proudly wore their decided sides shoe, around town. They wore that brand of sneaker in support of the brother they sided with. In fact, it was so bad that some stores would not allow people wearing the opposing side's tennis shoes into the store. I read of a story of where even when the handyman would come over to work on one of the houses of the opposing side, ah, but I tell you what, you can go down and pick out a brand new free pair of shoes. The rivalry was so fierce. So all this going on, both brothers for their prospective shoe company sought athletes to, to endorse and wear their sneakers. Muhammad Ali, Franz Beckenbauer, Zidane Zidane, popularly known as Zizou, legendary athletes, wore the three stripes of Adidas. Soccer icons and legends, Pele, Diego Maradona and tennis star Boris Becker reached their fame while wearing Pumas. The brothers, Pumas and Adidas, entered into a fierce and bitter battle of business rivalry after they split. So much so that it even affected the whole town. In fact, the story is told that the town was known as the town of bent necks, not beat necks, bent necks, because everywhere they went, the first thing they did when they met them was look down to see whose side you were on. <laughs> In fact, this whole thing led to probably the first case of Olympic competition compensation. At the 1960 Summer Olympics, Puma paid German sprinter Armin Harry to wear Pumas in the 100 meter sprint final. Harry had warned Adidas before and asked Adolf for payment, but Adidas rejected his request. So after winning, Harry went to the photo, unlaced the old shoes, and put on the opposing shoes, trying to cash in on both sides. Both brothers were just enraged at the situation. Ten years later, at the opening of the World Cup final, right as the ball was kicked off and the bell, the whistle was blown, Pele reached down and laced up his shoes in a seemingly ordinary act, but it was in fact pre-planned. A marketing ploy to draw everybody watching everybody in the stands to notice the pumas he was wearing. Sadly, the two brothers never reconciled. Adolf and Rudolf both died in the 1970s, and although they are now buried in the same church cemetery, they are buried at the opposite ends of the cemetery in order to be as far apart as in 2009, the two companies, trying to mend fences and bury the hatchets, decided to have an employee soccer game and come together and play just a friendly game. But despite the handshakes, the goodwill, pleasantries, the ghost of the Bitter Brothers still haunted the town they work in to this day. Revival. Today, Adidas and Puma are second and fourth to the most popular sports apparel companies in the world, and Nike is first. 
that is quite an interesting story about sibling rivalry. It's an amazing story. Some here have probably brushed up against a little bit of sibling rivalry in your life. Maybe you've faced a little bit of shenanigans or whatever it is that you faced in your life. When we look at scripture, we don't have to go far to find it. Cain and Abel, Jacob and Esau, Joseph sold into slavery by his brothers. There's a, there's a lot of sibling rivalry in the issue of disunity in the word of God. The prodigal son returning to face the angst of his brother. And it's without question there seems to be an incredible amount of rivalry and division between the sons of Jesse. David, the youngest of the household. His older brothers consisted of Eliab, Abinadab, Shimea, Nathaniel, Radai, and Ozem. There was obviously some issues between these brothers, obviously some jealousy, or just plain old sibling rivalry as the older brothers, you know, took it out on the younger brothers. That's how it rolled. That's how it works. So when we realize during the ceremony with Samuel that David is not called and he's seemingly left out, if you, if you read in 1 Samuel uh, chapter 16, it says in verse 6, and it came to pass when they were come that he looked on Eliab, and here's Samuel looking, he's been sent by God to anoint a king, a future king, and he looks at Eliab, and surely the Lord's anointed is before him. But the Lord said unto Samuel, look not on his countenance or on the height of his stature, because I have refused him. For the Lord seeth not as man, for man looketh on the outward appearance, but the Lord looketh on the heart. You got to pull that out of the story and lay that over your life. Lay it over your thinking. Then Jesse called Abinadab and made him to pass before Samuel and he said, neither hath the Lord chosen this. Then Jesse made Shema to pass by and he said, neither hath the Lord chosen this again. And again, Jesse made seven of his sons to pass before Samuel. The ceremony is going on and all the brothers that have gathered have gone through and the Lord hasn't chose any. And Samuel said to Jesse, the Lord hath not chosen these. And Samuel said unto Jesse, are here all thy children? And was it, what, was it with, with disdain? What was it that he was so overlooked that he would simply say, well, the youngest is out there watching the scene. You want the youngest? You want the smallest? You want... Samuel said to Jesse, fetch him, for we will not sit down till he come hither. This pause in this amazing ceremony probably only kindled even more problems between the brothers as they stood there waiting. I can imagine that they were probably dogging him, probably being aggressive. You ever get frustrated with your brother? You ever just think that they're probably not doing, you got all these thoughts and ideas in your mind about what you think of them. 1 Samuel 16 and 12 it says, and he sent and brought him, and now he was ruddy and with all of a beautiful countenance and goodly to look to. And the Lord said, arise, anoint him, for this is he. Oh man, can you imagine as all those other brothers had watched Samuel react to them, react different. To David. David is standing there, surrounded by his rejected siblings, when Samuel breaks forth and anoints him. Folks, that's going to be an awkward moment. Yeah. We have a hard time sometimes watching somebody be chosen. We don't like to be overlooked. We want everyone to do well, just not better than us. Sibling rivalry. And here is this awkward moment when the youngest of the brothers is being anointed in front of the older brothers and in front of his old, uh, anointed to be king. All they think of now is watching this little upstart growing up. It's, man, little brother. Can't do nothing right syndrome. The little brother, well, you just, when you've lived as long as we have, you'll get it, son. You'll get it, boy. 
you know, I'm pretty sure he was easily the one that was catching the brunt of the jokes, you know, the, the boyhood pranks, all the things. He was probably, you know, had given the worst jobs to do, laughed and shoved and his hair messed up and thumped in the shoulder by his brother, boys being boys. And now, after all this time of that, they're watching the very one who was the brunt of all this being anointed to be king. Not much is said after this moment. No congratulations are given. There was no party or celebration that we read of. No excitement or even acknowledging is found in the pages of our Bible. That being said, if you think about it, being the father of the future anointed king, man, that would be a pretty high honor. Wow. Being the brother of the king would certainly have benefits. But no one seems to care. No one seems to acknowledge it. There's nothing written about a family get-together. And all of a sudden, you know what? Let's revere our brother. Let's respect him. Let's respect what God, no, it wasn't there. Those men, his father, his brothers, who no doubt could benefit the most from David being king. Those who should have been the most supportive. Those should have taken on an air of being a guardian and protecting their younger brother. Those who should be there for the next king. In fact, the next time we read of David's name, he's back tending the family sheep. The opening of our text that I read to you is the next interaction between David and his brothers. We know that David has been sent by his father to the future king as being an errand boy. See, see, see when you're anointed, Nothing's beneath you. Are you hearing what I'm saying? It's servings beneath you, neither is beyond you. So David is standing there having obeyed his father, and he hears Goliath's challenge. And verse 25 of chapter 17, the men of Israel said, Have you seen this man that has come up? Surely to fight Israel is he come up? And it shall be the man who killeth him. The king shall enrich him with great riches and will give him his daughter and make his father's house free in Israel. Man, we have this whole commotion going on. Verse 26, and David spake to the men. So, wait a minute. What shall be done to the man that killeth this Philistine and taketh away the reproach of Israel? For who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? Listening to David's question, answered him after this manner, saying, So shall it be done to the man that killeth him. But here it is the moment, the next discourse that we read between David and his brother Eliab. Verse, uh, chapter 17, verse 20. Now Eliab, his oldest brother, heard when he spoke to the man. And Eliab's anger was aroused against David. There's a problem. David's willing to try, and he's getting the angst of an older brother. He's aroused. Why did you come down here? What are you doing here? This is my thing. <laughs> and with whom have you left those few sheep in the wilderness? I know your pride. And the insolence of your heart, for you have come down to see the battle. This is the first conversation after David's been anointed with one of his siblings. It's uncomfortable. It's awkward. It's sticky. It's human. It's people. We can put our suits on and we can come in here and act, but you know, I'm, I've been doing this a long time. Hey, folks, remember the old Prego commercial? It's in there. That pride, the stuff you struggle with. 
Eliab seems furious. He shows no concern that his brother is near a dangerous enemy. I said he's furious with David. Eliab doesn't show any concern that, you know, maybe I should help keep David safe right now. I know that he's been anointed and it's his, he's just doing his calling, but I'm still going, let me be protective of him. That's not found there. There's no concern that he should keep David safe, but he's more intent on rebuking him and questioning him. He's more involved in trying to humiliate and embarrass him than stand there and protect who she knows is anointed. What are you doing here? You're just here to watch. Why don't you just go take care of those two? Why don't you just go home? We, we don't want you here. You know what the narrative should have been? Hey, David. Hey, go. Hey, go. Go. Hey, go. Go, 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 go get behind me, David. Let me protect you and shelter you. I know you got a great work to do, but let me make sure I protect you. I'm the elder here. I'm, I'm the elder brother. I understand that there's battles and there's giants to fight. I've been dealing with one for 40 days. Now, let me protect you now that you're... David, please get behind me. David, you're important. Stay close by me. I got your back. I got your side. I'm your number one advocate. This is a battlefield. David, don't even think about stepping out onto that battlefield. Don't, don't think about fighting that giant. Don't, no, 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 no. What are you doing? What are you doing? Don't, 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 don't go talk to Saul. No, 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 don't, don't go try on that armor. David, what are you doing? What do you mean you're going to go face the giant, David? Wait a minute, David. I'm your big brother. Let me go. You know what, David, hold on. Let me take your place. Let Dave, David, let me step in. We can't risk losing you. I've got to protect you. I got to, I want to be there for you. Hold on, David. David, hold on. Your brothers and I, we know you're the next king. And we want to make sure you're safe to fulfill your calling. Let me stand and bridge the gap, protect you. That's not what happened. Scripture tells us what happened. He's being rebuked and ridiculed by his elder instead of being built up. David was being torn down by the very ones that should have been protecting him. And yet, despite being treated by his elder that way, David still goes. He still laces him up and steps out onto the battlefield. Out to fight the challenging giant that the elders would have faced. Out to face that giant alone. You know, where are David's brothers? David, we, in the valley, you could see him. On the battlefield alone, there's this young man. Where's Eliab? I, I see David. Okay. Where's, where's Abinadab? It's dangerous down there. Okay, okay. Where, where's, where's Phineas? Where, where's his brothers? Where's, he's, he's got all these brothers and he's alone? You have to understand while David goes down there and picks out those five smooth stones and all this is, is unfolding on the battlefield, that it's, you can't miss what's going on. Here's a young man walking out on the battlefield. Walking out to face a giant. 
that everybody that's watching is intimidated of. He's walking out to face a giant alone. As, as the word spread through all the men about David stepping on to the battlefield alone, his brothers are nowhere to be found. How can that happen? How can that be? Surely, surely his brothers would want to be there. There's no way good brothers would want to watch their brother face a giant alone. Surely his brothers would at least be close by, even if to gather the dead body. Where are the brothers? Where are the brothers? Where are the brethren? Surely at least one. One would stand with David. But no. Where are David's brothers? Where are the brothers? You know, critically, David, even if zealous in the moment, he's got the right intentions. He's got good intentions. He, he is willing to step up and fight the enemy. He wanted to end the fear that everyone faced. He wanted to defeat the enemy that had everybody in the army stalemated. David wanted to defeat the enemy of the very own brothers that wouldn't stand with him. David was on a mission to liberate, to set free everyone the enemy had bound. He was just trying to do something that would make a difference. Ask with me tonight, where are the brethren? Where are the brethren? No one had his back. They bailed on him. No one goes with him. He goes to face the greatest challenge yet. No one stood with him, not even his own brothers. Where are the brethren? Studies have shown that humans have a tendency to be a lot more difficult to those they're closest to. It's just something that happens. You can call it sibling rivalry. Whether it's bitterness, greed, jealousy, or anger. There are many reasons. With all the other examples of sibling rivalry in Scripture, Cain and Abel, Isaac and Ishmael, the prodigal and his brother, you know, we can go on and on. Many times we see someone fighting a battle or even just struggling. And sadly, instead of offering mercy, we throw malice. Instead of reaching out, we kind of have a habit of pushing back. <laughs> Look at the mess he got into. I'm not going to uh -huh, leave that to you. <laughs> well, what do you want me to do? They should have known better. They've been around long enough. They should have known better than to mess with that. As if any of us were perfect to begin with. Especially in a world like today. You think about it. Everything today seems to be acceptable. In a world today where 99% of what the Bible calls sin is tolerated. In our own homes we seem to tolerate so much mess. Even the mess that's boasted about kind of paints a picture of the world willing to accept them for who they are while the church is considered judgmental and full of condemnation. But we cannot let that be the case. Some of us stand off in an era of judgment and safety while we let 
brothers and sisters go to Babylon. And we forget that this is not a gathering of the perfect. The church is a hospital for the hurting. A place of hope for those that feel hopelessness. A place of restoration for those that have been broken. A, a refuge for those who've been brutalized by the things of this life. The church accepts all people. The church loves and is a place for all people from all walks of life. From No matter what darkness you emerge from, the church is a place of light and healing and love. And unity. It is with open arms that each and every one of us should say, you're welcome here. With open hearts, we declare, you do not have to be alone. If anyone has received mercy, it's the church. If anyone should extend the mercy, it's the church. If anyone should show mercy, it's the church. Where are the brothers? Where are the brethren? Where are those going to the highways and hedges to find when someone is struggling, to look for someone that's facing a giant, for looking and for someone so that you can step in and get your hands dirty and help? Where are the brothers? Where, where are the brethren? Where are the sisters? Where's the church? Even for that brother or sister that's struggling with old habits that come creeping back up. Galatians reminds us, brethren, if any man be overtaken in a fault, ye which are spiritual. Restore such a one in the spirit of meekness. Where's the brethren? Considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted. Bear ye one another's burdens, so fulfill the law of Christ. Where are the brothers? Where's the brethren? Where is that church when someone is in the fight of their life? Where are you right now while the world is going haywire? Are you holed up someplace immune to the fact that there's a giant bellowing in the valley of humanity? right now and people are in a fight for their very souls where's the brethren where's those that offer I'm standing with you I'm praying for you if you need anything I'm here you will not fight in that valley alone. You will not go through that by yourself. I'm going to stand with you. I'm going to walk with you. If we got to sit together and pray, to, we'll do it. I'm not just going to go and say, I'll oh, see you out of that. Hey, I'm with you, brother. I'm with you, sister. We're going to do it. We are the church. Unified. Matthew chapter 7. Read the New King James Version. It says, Judge not that you be not judged. For with what judgment you judge, you will be judged. And with the measure you use, it will be measured back to you. And why do you look at the speck in your brother's eye, but not consider the plank in your own eye? Or how can you say to your brother, Let me remove the speck in your eye? And look, a plank is your own eye. Hypocrite. First remove the plank from your own eye. And then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. You know, I could surmise that with just four words. We're not perfect. <laughs> Nobody in this building is perfect tonight. Nobody watching online is perfect tonight. We all struggle. We all fall, we all fail, we find ourselves in a valley, we all sin and come short of the glory of God. But the thing that bothers me is, is there someone here in the valley by yourself? We need to make sure the church is the main support system. We need to make sure as brothers and sisters in the church that nobody goes through anything by themselves. Don't bail on your brother. Don't bail on your sister. Stand in the gap. Bridge the gap in the head. Find your prayer life. You realize the things you're involving in may be stealing you away. 
from the saving of a brother facing a giant. We need to be the help that stands with folks in the valley. We need to make sure that no one faces a giant alone because there's a church. You know, in Luke chapter 10, you find it in Matthew and Mark also, you got the parable of the Good Samaritan. It says, And behold, a certain lawyer stood up and tested him, saying, Teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? And he said, What is written in the law? What is your reading of it? And he answered and said, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. And he said to him, You have answered rightly. Do this, and you will live. But he, wanting to justify himself, said to Jesus, And who is my neighbor? We change it today. Well, who, who does he want me to help? We're waiting for them to come knocking on our door. And we forgot that we're supposed to be going into all the world. Jesus answered and said, A certain man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell among thieves who stripped him of his clothing, wounded him and departed, leaving him half dead. Now by chance a certain priest came down that road, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. Likewise, a Levite, when he arrived at the place, came and looked and passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, as he journeyed, a half-breed, and we were all half-breeds, came where he was, and when he saw him, he had compassion. So he went to him and bandaged his wounds and pouring on oil and wine and sent him on his own animal. Brought him to an inn and took care of him. On the next day when he departed, he took out two denarii, gave them to the innkeeper and said, you take care of him and whatever you spend more when I come again, I will repay you. Which of these three do you think was neighbor to him that fell? And he said, he who showed mercy on him. And Jesus tells us all the answer to our life struggle. Go and do likewise. An analysis of the story is the believer wasn't the one that stopped. It wasn't the religious expert that stopped to help. It was the Samaritan that stopped and not only helped, but stayed involved. Stayed involved that he wasn't afraid of the unknown. Whatever it costs more, I'm in it. Whatever it goes beyond, I don't have a bottom line when it comes to the things of God. Whatever it costs more, I'm going to be there. Are you looking at rivals or for revival? Are you just religious or are we a vibrant in a vibrant relationship with God, whatever it takes, whatever it Are you watching your bottom line or are you looking for God? Where are you? Where are the brothers? Where's the church? Sibling rivalry or a revival of relationships? The Dassler Shoe Company started in 1924. Nike started in 1964, 40 years later. If the Dassler brothers had stayed together, there's almost no doubt they would be the largest leading global apparel company on the planet. The brothers had the same desire, dreams, and passion. They could have done more together than they ever could have done apart or divided. Today, if you add the value of Puma and Adidas combined, they value more than that of Nike. If they just could have stayed together. If they just could have stayed unified. If they just could have stayed unified in the cause instead of being divided. They could have done it. They could have done it. I could be wearing Dasslers tonight. But they were divided. There are two terms that I want to bring out tonight. Aligned 
and assembled. Aligned and assembled. Anybody here ever had a vehicle alignment? Because you're driving and everything is pulling to one side. It's hard to drive. It's hard to take it where it needs to go. And every time you're trying to go, something's pulling it off course. It's not going straight. It's out of alignment. Now listen. The car's assembled. It's all together. It has all its parts. It has everything it needs. go in the proper direction that we want it to. It can't just be assembled. It's got to be in alignment. In order for the church to get where it's going to do what it's called to do. Hold on. In order for your home, in order for you and your relationships and your family, you just can't assemble. You've got to be in alignment. You just can't gather, gather together. There's got to be one mind and one accord. You've got to get aligned. We all desire to make heaven. We can all make it. But we just can't assemble. We've got to get in alignment. We've got to get going in the same direction. Oh, let's keep assembling. It's important, but it's not enough. We got to get aligned. We got to get aligned. This past year was a tremendously divided year. Without going into a lot of the politics, there was a lot of stuff that happened. In Louisville, Kentucky, Officer Galen Henshaw heard the call over the radio. One of, his, one of his fellow officers was in serious trouble. A crowd of protesters had marched to Second and Main and surrounded a police cruiser at the base of Clark Memorial Bridge. The officer inside radioed for help as protesters, as angry protesters covered in the strobe blue and red lights of the patrol car. Banged on the hood and windshield. Hinshaw, 4th Division, patrol officer and part of the Louisville Metro Police Department, special response, response team, drove as close as he could to the area. As he got out of his cruiser, he was immediately surrounded by protesters. He made his way through the crowd wearing 40 extra pounds of safety gear, a baton, a vest, a helmet, and body armor. He was alone. As the crowd grew, Henshaw detoured to the front of Birno's Pizzeria so he could keep his back to the wall. He needed a place to stop and assess this very serious situation. He had to make sure that nobody could get behind him. He also needed to keep an eye on his trapped colleague. Overhead, a police helicopter kept watch and occasionally was able to flood the intersection with a spotlight. Sirens pierced the air. Protesters chanted louder and screamed louder. Henshaw's nearest help was blocks away. The crowd moved closer. Yelling got angry. Protesters hurled questions at him. Are you one of the good ones? How do you think we feel? One woman screamed, all gas, no brakes. He tried to respond, but was drowned out by the sounds and sirens and yelling. We do care. We do care, he said. Henshaw tried to reason with the crowd. I'm sorry, I'm sorry you feel this way, Henshaw yelled, trying to make his voice heard over the anger of the crowd. 
The 32-year-old was scared. He knew it was only going to take one person. And everyone did jump in. The special response team trains once a month, but that hadn't quite prepared Henshaw for what was in front of him. If the protesters decided to attack, there was just too many. Here we go, he thought. I'm preparing to be injured or worse. Henshaw kept his voice calm as he radioed in. Charlie 12, this is 1030. We need help. 1030 is the code an officer uses when he needs help. Watching hands in the crowd, making sure nobody had a weapon or scanning for anything to be thrown from a po protester. It was at this moment that the man that you see emerged from the crowd in a red U University of Louisville mask covering the lower half of his face. He placed himself between the closest protester and Henshaw. Local entrepreneur Darren Jr. Lee saw Henshaw and the advancing crowd and jumped in and linked arms with the stranger in the red mask. Once I saw the guy in the red mask step up, he said, I got to step up too, said Lee, who also runs a child care center. I was reactive. I just went. He had no idea what happened next. And I really thought at that moment, protect him. It really isn't his fault what's going on, Lee said. Lee was also worried that Henshaw would react and hit him from behind. So he turned to reassure Henshaw, I am here to protect you. He was looking nervous and scared, Lee said. If he panicked, there was going to be an all-out war. Suddenly, the protesters seemed to turn on Lee. One man who had marched with him for nearly the whole protest was surprised. Another shouted in Lee's face, how can you protect him? Lee started to get nervous. Ultimately, five men formed a human shield to protect Officer Henshaw. All of them strangers to one another. Nobody knew the name of the man to his left or to his right. There were three black, one white, one half Dominican, all arms linked, keeping harm away from Henshaw, himself half Pakistani. Ricky McKellen said, a human was in trouble and right is right. After reaching the bridge and watching some protesters throwing rocks at police guards, McKellen spotted Henshaw as he walked around the group and thought, whoa, you're by yourself? Officer McKellen watched as the crowd around Henshaw grew larger and louder. Then he heard Lee, Lee yell, lock arms, lock arms. That's when Julian de la Cruz saw the men locking arms and also jumped in. I saw the guys link up. And I saw a weak spot, De La Cruz said, and he took up that position on the end of the line. He was nervous. He was scared. Things could have gotten really bad, he said. Later, Henshaw said, those guys, those men saved me. There's no doubt about it. I'm beyond thankful. If it wasn't for them, intervening and recognizing that I was in trouble and helping me, I am sure that I would have been assaulted. Henshaw to this day continues to be moved by that moment. He said he still cries over the incident. He said it is a moment where strangers came together to help another stranger and that stranger As the musicians come, I want to close out with the next word of scripture. Exodus chapter 17, as we stand. Then came Amalek and fought with Israel in Rephidim. And Moses said unto Joshua, choose out men, go and fight. Fight with Amalek. Tomorrow I will stand on the top of the hill with the rod of God in my hand. 
So Joshua did as Moses had said to him and fought with Amalek. Moses, Aaron, and Hur went up to the top of the hill. And it came to pass when Moses held up his hand that Israel prevailed. And when Moses let down his hand, Amalek prevailed. But Moses' hands were heavy. They took a stone and put it under him, and he sat thereon. And Aaron and Hur stayed up his hands, the one on the one side and the one on the other. And his hands were steady unto the going down of the sun. And Joshua discomfited Amalek and his people with the edge of the sword. This story, again, paints a, an amazing picture of unity, of a united effort in the midst of a storm, in the midst of a battle. Joshua down in the valley, Moses up on the mountain, holding his hands up with the rod of God. Praying and interceding for Joshua. No doubt Moses was a, a good leader. But Moses grew tired. But as he grew tired, he had Aaron and her by his side. <laughs> you know, Joshua couldn't win the battle without Moses. Moses couldn't keep his hands up without Aaron and her. Listen, not everybody's called to be a Moses or called to be a Joshua, but everyone is called to be an Aaron or a her, to be united, to be aligned. Alignment leads to get great anointing and victory. If souls harbor, if you, if I, really want to be part of an end time Holy Ghost filled apostolic church we just can't gather and assemble we must get aligned we must be united we must show a united front are you hearing me there's a statement made that the Lord makes in Genesis and the Lord said behold the people is one and they have all one language, and this they begin to do. And now nothing will be restrained from them which they have imagined to do. So that's the question. That's what you must ask yourself. Revival or rival? How can I let my brother go down in the valley and face a battle by himself? How can I allow anyone to go and face something that I turn my back on him and abandon him? How can I let my brother, let my sister, let a family, let anybody I know go and do anything alone when I got everything that can help? Even if it's my presence, even if it's my prayer, even 